it's companies donating tickets, it's uh, companies donating money and also individuals. So thank you very much and uh, we're well ahead of hitting our target this year for uh, 35,000.
Registration notices were sent out yesterday, so please be sure to check your emails for invitations. As you know, the event has allowed us to raise funds in the past to donate to both local charities and actual research since its inception. Not only is it for a good cause, but it's also a lot of fun for your company. Please reach out to Sandy or to Colleen Fox, who is organizing it this year, or reach out to myself if you have any questions. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you there. I would now like to call upon Luke Pellerin to uh, discuss some, some items that uh, have come up recently in regards to performance specifications. Luke, Luke put on a fantastic uh, tech session earlier, so first of all, actually, I'd like to thank you for that. Some of you may not know, but the uh, National Master Spec, the NMS, was moved, uh, or I should say transferred from Public Works uh, to the NRC in 2015. Uh, in uh, about April 2017, we started putting a team together to uh, tackle some improvement. Uh, some of the goals uh, GHG reduction to align with uh, Public Works and DMD, uh, better harmonization with uh, the National Building Code, which is also under NRC. Uh, and also trying to capture some of the outcomes of the R&D that's been done in, uh, in, uh, at the construction research end. Um, another project we've been doing too is um, uh, designed for climate resilient infrastructure. And uh, in fact, in the pipeline now as a result of all this, we're building new commissioning content in the NMS, uh, including new commissioning section. We're trying to incorporate uh, smart building initiatives and uh, the last thing is new, an overall of performance-based uh, sections. And uh, I'm not sure if some of you guys have used them. Uh, what the NMS had originally, or I should say still published right now, is absolutely horrible. Uh, <laughs> so the reason why we're trying to overhaul. So we start a new process, a new structure, and we start drafting content. But we're trying to invite the industry to, to uh, get some feedback or even some help on reviewing uh, the material. Uh, obviously, this is more volunteer based, but uh, uh, I think there's some reward in seeing the process and seeing how performance based specifications are developed. Uh, and actually, you probably get, well, you would get your hand on the content without buying the stuff from the publisher after. Um, and the other thing, too, is we're trying to aim performance based specification not only towards design build, but to help in design development. So, using performance based specifications to transfer to final construction uh, documents. So if there's any interest, you can reach me or uh, by email or uh, through the uh, NRC website. We do have a generic NMS uh, uh, email. I'll probably still hang around too after uh, after dinner. But uh, um, anyways, thanks for thanks for the invite. It was, uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'll just wish you a good evening as well. So one of the nominations that affects Canadians, it's not in Region 2, it's in Region 11, which is west of uh, Ontario. Bill Dean was nominated to uh, move up to Society Vice President. And then many of you know that Daryl Boyce is currently the Society President-elect, and come June he will actually be sworn in and start his year as President of Ashray Society. July. So to have somebody at that level that comes from the Ottawa chapters is pretty outstanding. I would now like to call upon the tabletop displays and recognize the fantastic uh, people that have been here for that. And I'd like to start with Jacob Huff. And I'm going to skip Jacob Huff, given that response. I will go with the back way. If you could talk about uh, VR, come on. Dr. Gear or from uh... No, no, come here. Okay. It'd be, it'd be the yell from there, but it'd be a little more awkward. I think it'd be more fun to go up here. I think everyone, so uh, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with VR and the technology in some way or another. Uh, we also had a pull-up for our uh, ground flow uh, evaporator head and not picture 
Jeff has previously been with Saras Technologies, where he honed his experience over 15 years dealing in every aspect of the dehumidification industry. Prior to being selected to manage this current body, Jeff was a senior sales manager and sales engineer who successfully consulted on and managed dehumidification programs of every size of Great North America. A lot of Jeff's talk tonight is going to focus on what we should be thinking of and what we should be considering in regards to indoor agriculture. A lot of this is applicable to some of the recent developments locally and I mean across Canada, uh, specifically in regards to cannabis growth, but also just general indoor agriculture. Joe is going to provide an overview and uh, give us some things to think about, some old, old rules of thumb that uh, perhaps are valid and some that we really should be thinking a little bit harder about. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Joe. Uh, 
at multiple levels. So we're working on a facility here in London that is uh, going to be four racks tall. So uh, it just drives power density and it becomes a bit of a challenge there. Um, we're going to go through the, the whole cannabis growth cycle here shortly. Uh, food products, though, are always going to be multi-level, and those multi-level facilities can get quite power dense. Um, project uh, near Toronto, it's a 7,000 square foot room. It's a 500 kilowatt sensible load in that space. So power density there is incredible. And air distribution, of course, with those multi-level rows is very important. Um, because those, you know, those are convection cool LED lights, the canopy needs to be moving, the lights need to be able to reject the heat. Um, so getting an accurate flow rate through that canopy is important. And the growers want the air movement. Don't be afraid of 30 or 40 air changes an hour. That's pretty typical in this space. Getting a full meter per second of velocity, no problem. So in lighting, historically we've been doing a lot of high intensity discharge lighting. Uh, that's starting to change over to LED. Typical value of 50 or so watts per square foot of light power. Um, we've got some pictures later on that are going to show that needs to take into account the balance of the lights. High intensity discharge will typically have a 15 or so percent increase in power because of ballast. And LED lights uh, are starting to actually move the drivers out of the space. So, to reduce again the sensible load in that space. An interesting way to do that. We're going to be talking about the lighting schedule and what that means to the space as well. Um, in ventilation terms, code really hasn't caught up. Uh, they're technically process spaces. There is a requirement in Ontario for life safety purge function if you're going to be injecting CO2 into that space. So if that space ever gets above 5,000 parts per million, access to that space has to be controlled and the space has to be reduced to below 3,500 parts per million in 15 minutes or less. That said, uh, general uh, occupancy values haven't yet been guidelined by ASHRAE or anybody else. Most engineers are doing occupancy scheduler and just typical occupancy of the rear based on 62.1. These facilities uh, are also typically doing CO2 injection. They want to inject to roughly three times ambient with CO2, um, which again drives that purge requirement potentially. If you're going to be exhausting, particularly in a cannabis space, there may be a need to do some odor neutralization. So, be wary of that. Uh, being a good neighbor for these facilities is typically pretty important. So, going through uh, the cannabis growth cycle, um, have, have any of you guys ever been in one of these facilities? Oh, there's a couple in the back. <laughs> couple of them, yeah, yeah. So, we're going to go through, uh, for those who haven't, for those who aren't familiar, um, a typical growth. Again, these are, these are very typical things. They're not, certainly not cast in stone. And as a, as a consulting engineer or as a mechanical designer, uh, getting this in writing from your grower, from your customer, is very important. What they do changes based on the strain of growing, based on the mass of grower on a given day. So knowing that and having that in writing and being able to refer back to that is very important. So the, the start of the growth cycle is typically a mother plant. And these are going to be grown relatively warm, relatively humid, a fairly long light cycle, typically 16 or 18 hours long, um, and relatively easy to control. It's not a particularly dense space, there's not a ton of water in there. And those mother plants um, get pruned, and that's what ends up, ends up producing the genetic clones that go for the strain that they're producing. Again, pretty easy. And you can see um, a typical mother root not a super dense space, not particularly challenging. From there, those plants are going to spend some amount of time in a clone room, and those prunes are going to grow and establish a root bed in a very hot, relatively high humidity space. Density is not super critical. Uh, the challenge in this particular room is because of its high temperature and high relative humidity, there can be a significant cost of humidification that way. Growers are going to want to maintain typically something like 80 or 85 degrees Fahrenheit and 70% relative humidity. So a 70 degree dew point or higher and getting a sensible uh, or managing a sensible load without taking too much moisture out is important. 
Next, uh, those clients are going to spend some time in the bedroom. And after that clone cycle, uh, again, this varies very, very much based on the grower. Some have clone and bag just one step, some challenge, some change between. Uh, but this is where they go from being a relatively small, new, uh, established plant to something that's close to full size and ready to get into the flowering cycle. Again, more relatively humid, late load is starting to become a, a significant factor in that space as that foliage gets bigger. Uh, and those will again be a typical 16 or 18 hour light on schedule. From there, it goes into flower. And this is the most challenging room by a mile. The plants are uh, full size, you're going to get your full late load. It's a 12 hour on, 12 hour on light cycle, exactly. Um, but the, the challenge here is that most growers are going to want to stress the plants late into the flower cycle. So they're going to start at a, again, relatively warm, relatively humid condition, um, something like an 80, 55, or 80, 60, easy to control for. Towards the end of the growth cycle, they might want to get as dry as a 65, 40. So knowing that and knowing what the grower wants to do is very, very important from an HVAC design perspective. Uh, because obviously enough, it, it makes a big difference to the HVAC application. After that grow, most facilities will take everything out of the room and wash it down completely. So, again, from an HVAC design perspective, from an electrical design perspective, making sure that everything in that space is easy to clean is very important for the grower. A mold outbreak in a room can wipe out a quarter million dollars a crop instantly. So, the, the, the liability in this space is sort of unlike anything that we'll typically see. Um, so after that, after the flowers are full grown, and they've gone through that late flower stress cycle, they're not going to get dry. And that dry cycle will take between 3 and 10 days, typically. Again, it's going to depend on the grower and whether they're producing for dry product or if they're producing for extract. Typically, they're wanting to remove about 80% of that mass. And some growers will use something, uh, an automated curing system of some kind, and some will just have an adjustable dead band on a piece of dehumidification equipment. Again, relatively easy to handle from that perspective. The only sensible load in that space is from the dehumidification equipment itself. And then, optionally, a cure cycle. Right now, frankly, we don't have a lot of growers doing this because there's not enough products available in Canada and nobody wants to wait. Um, but that product might be stored for as much as a year um, curing. That space is very, very simple. The product is typically sealed. There's no relative humidity or temperature requirements other than just something nice and stable. So in general terms, that's the cannabis growth cycle. Again, get this from your grower. Understand your <coughs> expectations. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to matter a huge amount for your HVAC design. So, uh, in terms of unique challenges of this industry, uh, the biggest one is just power density. These are, are very power dense rooms. They have power densities that make data centers look sort of typical. Uh, the problem with it though is there's a latent load. It's not a sensible in space. And so because those plants are transpiring both during lights on and more importantly during lights off, there's a need for dehumidification the whole growth cycle. And that's where a lot of engineers have so far gotten into trouble. They've designed sensible cooling only systems that have some measure of dehumidification when the lights are on, when there's a sensible cooling load. But then when the lights turn off and there's no more cooling load, there's also no more dehumidification available. Um, you may also start to see some vapor pressure differential demands from the growers, um, measuring the temperature of the canopy um, and trying to maintain a relative humidity or a temperature and relative humidity, um, typically at a deficit of something like five grams per cubic meter. That's uh, starting to get pretty deep into the controls part. I'm not going to talk about that too much. Again, very grower specific, um, but something to be aware of that you may see a demand like that. Uh, and then again, we've got a variable space. A couple of years ago, it was pretty typical to have a grower show up, um, go to a, a breaker on the wall or a disconnect on the wall throw that disconnect and have 200 kilowatts of sensible load show up in the space. Um, now, unfortunately, with LEDs, we're seeing a lot more sunrise and sunset cycles. Um, so from an HVAC perspective, it's a little bit easier to control. 
Um, there are some strain specific requests for temperature and humidity. Um, again, that's just going to be based on, on what that grower wants to do. Master growers are starting to, uh, to turn over as well. And then as the industry legitimizes, um, we're starting to see master growers control the grow less and the business side, the investment side, take a bigger interest in yield versus temperature. So, and then unfortunately, it's a difference in how people are paid. Master growers are paid based on yield. The company makes money based on what they can sell. So a master grower may choose a temperature relative humidity level that increases their yield by a couple of percent at a 10% penalty in energy. The master grower likes to do that, the business doesn't. So again, we need to, uh, we need to, to manage that expectation pretty early on. Um, and then the growers are also doing product differentiation based on different conditions, based on that late flower stress. Some growers are producing a craft dry product. Some growers are producing with the pure purpose of extracting and really don't care what that final product looks like, certainly in terms of temper, of color, and turkey content. So when we're doing uh, the application sizing for these, uh, again, space condition, what that grower wants to achieve is the number one driver. From a sensible cooling perspective, it's just lights. Uh, relatively simple from that perspective, a watt in is a watt out. And then water use is the same story. Uh, we generally uh, expect that every gallon of water into that space is going to be transpired over the course of the day. Plants will grow up to about 5% in vegetable mass on a daily basis. It's quite difficult from my perspective, sizing equipment, to take that into account. Um, same story with the sensible load in the space. Uh, that energy to drive the evapotranspiration process comes from the lights. And so not all of the wattage in the lights is going to turn into sensible. Some of that is going to become latent load in the space. Taking that into account when you're doing equipment sizing means that if you've got small plants in the space, you can't have your lights on because you don't have that transpiration. So from my perspective, it is a, a risky thing to do on a sizing basis. And again, uh, so talk about water in is water out. Transpiration during the night, that first hour after lights off is going to be about 80% of the lights on transpiration, and that's going to fall to about 30% overnight. The biggest myth, or one of the biggest myths in this industry, is that as the lights turn off, the plants pump a bunch of moisture into the space. And that's not true. What the growers typically do, though, is they have a nighttime temperature reduction. And so they reduce their temperature by 8 or 10 degrees and see a commensurate 20 or 25 percent spike in relative humidity and assume that there's a lot more moisture in their space when the grains have stayed exactly the same. Um, so again, based on that, 15.6, you can solve for X, um, figure out how much water is in space, off you go. So in each fact design, these are the things that we want to be talking about. Um, the sensible heat ratio of the equipment that you're using so that you're not either over drying or under drying your space. Power density, the airflow requirements, get enough air into that space. And if you don't get enough air into the space with the primary piece of air handling equipment, the growers are going to put air rotation fans into the space. Those air rotation fans, unfortunately, tend not to be great quality fans. They tend to be hard to clean, so they become a vector for infection in the space. And so whatever we can do, again, to get that stuff out of the space makes for better rooms, makes for better rows. Um, filtration is one that we'll, uh, I guess, touch on now. Um, there's a, a frequent question of whether or not we should be using UV or an ozonation system of some kind, um, an active filtration to kill off mold spores and bacteria. Uh, the reality is that mold is quite resilient to those things, and so your Dose rate and time needs to be quite long to be effective. Most growers take the approach of we're going to filter at a MER 13 level, which is, uh, you know, match rate says that MER 11 is enough to get rid of mold and mildew spores. Filter MER 13 and prevent stuff from getting into the space, prevent contamination, don't treat it. And then if you have a problem, you wipe the space and start over. Uh, there's also a growing body of research that says that ozone is destructive to the plants. 
And so those active filtration technologies produce ozone, and that ozone ends up in space and can end up actually reducing the yield in there. Um, just uh, some things to keep in mind when you're talking about HVAC design. Um, we see it all the time, unfortunately, that designers will put fan color units above the tables, and then you've got a maintenance guy that's fighting a master grower to go change filters. Um, and everybody's pretty annoyed about that. Or you've got a water leak that falls onto trays. Again, people don't like that. Um, it needs to be a cleanable system, typical full washdown between rows. Um, and then the electrical load needs to be considered as well. These are incredibly power dense buildings. And we've had, uh, had the situation before where an engineer has designed a two pipe chill water system, put a 30 kilowatt electric heater on every fan coil, and then was surprised when he couldn't get an ESA certification for his building. And that was already an 11 MVA building. So these are incredibly power dense structures. So in terms of system options, uh, there's sort of three different ways that you can go. There's pros and cons to each, of course. Um, chilled water is sort of the default. Um, if you were to talk to most engineers and say, I've got a thousand ton building, most of them are going to default to saying you need central plants of some kind. Um, the biggest issue here is dew point. It's obviously pretty hard to get a low 40s dew point out of a 45 degree chilled water. And that's what the growers want at the end of the growth cycle. Um, which means that able to, do, or to be able to do that, you need to, something like a 35 degree chilled water loop, which also means that you need a full time reheat loop available. It needs to be a four pipe system because you can't be delivering 45 degree air to the plants. You'll shock them and kill them. So there are problems there. Obviously, electric reheat um, has its own set of issues, primarily um, on an energy perspective, and your electrical engineers are going to hate you in the design. Uh, and then control implications on that. Now that said, the kilowatt hours per ton, generally speaking, lower. Um, with that need for reheat and how you derive that reheat, you have to look at it from an overall energy perspective. Um, and again, that needs to be available 24/7. Many, or it's come up a couple times where designers say they only want to be at that lower dew point the last couple of weeks, so we'll just have a turn down for those last couple of weeks. That doesn't work because these facilities don't operate one flower room at a time. They probably have a dozen or more flower rooms that are in various stages. You can think from an operation perspective, it doesn't make sense to have all of your rooms ready to harvest the same day, and to need staff to harvest all of those rooms the same day, versus having a room that's harvested every week. Which means that that lower temperature water needs to be available all the time, and that setback just doesn't work. So, the other option that unfortunately we see a lot is a sensible cooling system with a supplemental dehumidification of some kind. We still have growers installing stuff like this today, mostly because it's cheap and it's quick. You can go to most places and you can get a 15 ton rooftop air conditioning unit on the shelf for a thousand bucks a ton, give or take, and then put supplemental dehumidification in there and you're fine. Again, we've got that low ambient issue in winter. Place like this, we saw earlier this week. Um, you've got an outdoor condenser, and you've got a system that needs to be able to operate down to something like a minus 30 degree design here in Ottawa. We've got facilities in Edmonton that need to be able to, to operate at a minus 40 degree design. And so that low ambient condition is important. It's one of the only buildings that I know of that has a full cooling demand in the middle of the winter. The coldest day of the year has exactly the same cooling demand as the sun. Um, these coils are typically going to be optimized for sensible cooling. You may or may not have reheat available to do a dehumidification system um, or to do a dehumidification mode. We do see also some chilled water systems that use very or varying airflow to achieve a dehumidification cycle. So they'll either turn off a fan or slow down fans, slow down the air through the coils, cool it off, and dehumidify. But they also typically have a sensible D rate during that function. So you can either be cooling, or you can be dehumidifying. And for those who are familiar with the site chart in this room, when you're controlling to one, you lose control of the other every time. If you cool, your relative humidity goes up. If you go into a dehumidification cycle then, you, you lose that sensible capacity, your temperature goes up, relative humidity goes down, and you're just punting all the time. 
Um, these are often also paired with standalone dehumidifiers. Those work. They're typically small, portable units in the sort of 500 pint a day range, uh, but they project all of the heat back into the space. So it's an energy penalty to do that, typically about 30% in energy cost because you're paying to dehumidify and then you're paying to cool that energy as well. Um, something, again, quick and easy and dirty to get set up. Uh, a lot of growers are still doing it because they want to get through the two grow cycles required to get licensed. Once you get that two grow, and you start making some money, people then start retrofitting. <coughs> this all the time. Your other option is to do a dehumidification system that has heat rejection included. Cooling is a byproduct of dehumidification. A dehumidifier typically just puts all that energy back in the airstream. Uh, but there's also the option to have that energy put somewhere else and reject it for air conditioning. These coils are typically optimized for latent, latent cooling, which means that you, they can struggle in the late flower cycle when you don't have the enthalpy of the return air or you don't have enough air through that system to maintain your suction temperatures. Uh, so there's a, a requirement there to be very careful with a sensible heat ratio to make sure that that system can still run and can still do what you need it to when you've got 65, 40 degree air coming back and uh, you know, not enough energy in that air to keep that refrigeration circuit working. Some manufacturers get around that by using a hot gas bypass, but that's a pure efficiency D rate on that system. There's a couple of other ways to get around it as well. Um, they, um, basically, most facilities these days are going with dehumidification systems with heat rejection. Part of the reason for that is scalability. These growers, don't want all of their rooms to be ready the same day. Again, they need to get through those couple cycles to be able to get licensed. There's a capital cost associated with having your whole facility ready before you can actually produce anything. Um, so these are uh, relatively inexpensive to scale out um, compared to some other systems. So um, a couple other things that, uh, you know, just in the last couple minutes here of the presentation, um, the drive for density is becoming very real. And that's driving most or many growers away from a greenhouse or a mixed light facility. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that, uh, a couple of good reasons for it. Even. You can imagine, as a building manager, if you've got a million square feet of greenhouse, it takes your staff longer to go to the bathroom, it takes them longer to come back from lunch. It's a much less efficient way to operate something. Your, your product needs to be moved around more, um, there's more risk associated. And you can actually save any money, at least in electrical fit up, because that whole facility needs to be lit. These aren't tomatoes, um, they need that 12 hours of light year round. So you've got supplemental lighting in the winter, you've got blackout curtains in the summer to make sure you're at that 12 hours of light. Um, the other thing that, you know, Canada is obviously a world leader in this way. We've heard a lot about that over the last year. And that's what's going to drive growth in Canada over the next little while. Obviously, we, uh, a lot of people are excited about legalization for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one of the ones that, that is interesting to me in particular is that our regulatory framework is very attractive to a lot of countries. And so places like Germany, who have legalized medically, don't allow a product to be produced domestically. They buy it from Canada because they like our regulatory framework and it's easier to do that for them. And again, most of these facilities are going to be phased out. You're going to have one phase, you're going to get that license, you're going to get a couple rows, and you're going to do phase two, three, and four. And so from an HVAC design perspective, it's important to take that into consideration and to have a system that's easily scaled out. Uh, because growers probably don't want to do it, at least if they're making money. Uh, the other thing we're starting to see a lot of is real estate investment trusts that are building purpose-built cannabis buildings. So they're, they're basically building a ready-built building, water, lighting, HVAC included, and renting it to a grower who may not have the capital to set up the building himself. Um, working on a project in uh, Northern Ontario, it's gonna be 1.7 million square feet of exactly that. So it's a pretty big project. Um, and that one's funded by Swiss Bank. So, um, again, as this industry legitimizes everybody, Everybody wants their piece. So just some final thoughts again. We're going to have uh, some pretty, you know, the next three, four, five years in Canada for cannabis are going to be big. 
the money in this industry is going to drive changes that are going to affect the food market. Local is the new organic. So people are going to start converting some of these facilities, particularly vertical farms, into doing leafy greens, lettuce, strawberries. I mean, you'll pay five bucks all year round for five strawberries, and you can produce them very easily indoors. Um, and so we're going to see that change over the next couple of years um, that drives new projects from cannabis to food. And again, as the legitimization of this industry happens, as we see that change from grower-driven buildings to return on investment-driven buildings, and as the engineering community starts actually working on these projects, um, it wasn't two years ago that most engineering firms wouldn't touch uh, cannabis projects, either legal or not. Uh, these days, everybody's at will. Um, but this, this last piece is probably more important than ever. Knowing what your customer wants to do, knowing what their expectations are, um, is very important. And dragging that out of them is going to be sometimes difficult. It's a cagey community. They don't want to let their secrets out. Um, they, they feel sometimes that, uh, that their secret is really what sets them apart. And so signing NDAs is a very typical part of this world. Um, but it's important to get all of that information up front because it matters a huge amount for your system design. Um, the other part, uh, if there are growers in the room, I'm sorry. I'm sure you're not them. But growers are sometimes not the most technically capable people. And they tend to be farmers. That's what they do. So if you're designing a mechanical system that requires a full-time certified plant engineer, your farmer may not be capable of running a facility like that. So considering the, you know, keeping it simple for them, keeping it simple but functional uh, is worth, worth talking about anyway. Uh, again, knowing your design is very important. That's what I've got for you today. Do you guys have any questions for me?
Uh, some other events that I would like to point out. The Better Buildings Breakfast is holding a breakfast on February the 1st at the Hellenic Meeting and Reception Center. They will have Dr. Diane Sachs, who is the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, and she will be providing an overview of the most recent greenhouse and gas progress report. So if that is something that is of interest to you, please let me know and I can give you some details on that. Otherwise, our next meeting is February 19th here at the Centurion Center, and I would Remind everybody that you will, or I expect that you will be receiving an email with a survey. Please let us know your thoughts. That helps us to prepare future programs and future seminars. The information that we get from that is really, I mean, it's, it's testing the pulse of the community to see what you guys want to see. Another note, uh, there's a comment section on there, and I would be interested to just gauge from the crowd. How many people like Thursday for meetings? Uh, oh, sorry, no, I meant in, in the survey. I don't know. The hands up worked, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not counting right now. No, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out, for uh, making it through the ice and snow of yesterday and today, and uh, for being part of tonight. Thank you very much.